very good morning to you all respected principal dr hewasa king our guest speaker dr kananda chopi our special guest miss kalisana uh, from eastern christian college in hartim my colleagues and our dear students the best form of education as educators are well aware is to influence an all round development in an individual in nagaland tets college our institution has long been a forerunner in putting this into practice aligned with our college's motto to strive for excellence our mission to empower people towards lifelong excellence and our vision to create a positive impact in the world our institution emphasizes on learning beyond the syllabi and hence provides opportunities and support engaging in learning activities beyond classroom teaching learning experience our today's program while organized by our department that is department of sociology is a manifestation of the ideas and values that the tetsu community in general share and aspires for commonly the northeast region is a region of national and international significance because of its strategic geographical location it is a region with a complex history and socio cultural life it is for this reason that the region has long attracted many researchers to engage in its studies however experts have recently started voicing out the need to revise and introduce new methods of under understanding the region and we are so privileged that today we are able to organize this discussion in rethinking social research in northeast india with dr kanato chopi as our guest speaker dr kanato chopi in my personal opinion needs no introduction he is what we may call an international celebrity in the academia despite his young age and his young looks he is already a well recognized and well respected scholar and writer in the international community he is currently engaged as an assistant professor department of anthropology dibrugar university he was a recipient of the prestigious young india fellowship 2017 and his most recent book Christianity and Politics in Tribal India was co-published by State University of New York. This book was positively received by the academia with many organizing discussions on it and according to him till last night NIT invited him to particularly have a discussion on this particular book. So it is going on so well and it has received lots of reviews from leading newspaper in the country including the Hindustan Times. so we are definitely privileged and honestly excited to have you with us today we also have in our midst dr hewasa king our inspiring supporting and amazingly efficient principal we have miss kalisanya nalio hod department of sociology eastern christian college and our students besides our own honor students we have students from various other departments joining us today to begin with i would like to now give the time to Dr. Hewasa L. King, Principal Tetsu College, to give the welcome address. Good morning, everyone, students, faculty. Um, it gives me immense pleasure to be addressing all of you this morning to welcome you all to this seminar, uh, for which we have our resource person, Dr. ji kanato chofi uh it is really i think we have students from other departments also joining us yeah. so it's it's such a pleasure to see the sociology department organizing a talk like this on the topic of rethinking social research in northeast uh we need to be hearing topics and talks like this when it comes to research as already highlighted by our moderator i think the importance of rethinking looking at new approaches of study and what it actually means to be doing research and to be looking at research methodology so i would like to take this time to welcome each one of you to open up your minds and keep an open mind about you know this topic and this theme because the air in the field of research things are always changing 
new strategies, new approaches, and there are always new findings. And I think our resource person here will, is the perfect, Dr. G. Kanato is the perfect person to be addressing the students and the faculty on uh, this new age research and what, how, what it means to be doing research in these times post the pandemic as well. So I've had the privilege of hearing Dr. G. Konato on two occasions. One was at a principal's conference on the new education policy, and another one was at Jaffa College. And that was on the migration history of the Nagas. And there is no doubt that he is a individual, an expert in his field. And so we have, it is a great opportunity for Jetso College to be having his presence here so that we can learn from him and also share ideas and have a discussion, which I think these sessions are all meant for, okay, to question and to have, have develop deeper thinking uh, into areas unexplored. So I'd like to encourage all of the students to not hesitate you know to ask questions or to give comments or suggestions and i'd like to also welcome the eastern christian college students and the faculty member the hod for coming and being a part of this session um, it's great to have students from other institutes coming and interacting here at Ditso college our doors are always open for uh, engagements of this kind so uh, please make use of this opportunity, everyone, okay? Uh, while you have the chance, uh, grab on to, you know, the moment that you have with our resource person, also with our faculty, and also uh, engagement with one another. Uh, while I'm up here, I just wanted to share a story, uh, a, a story about uh, translation and uh, an outlook towards research. Uh, there was a friend of mine who had asked who had asked this translator what was the first act of translation in the history of mankind and the translator said it must have been something out of or translated from Egyptian since the Egyptian civilization is one of the oldest civilizations and from what we've learned in history and so my friend thought for a while and said no that can't be it. The first instance of translation was when a mother first heard her baby crying or babbling and had to interpret what it meant. That's just an anecdote on an instance of different perspectives and approaches of studies or looking at situations. So to analyze that story come. to analyze that story we have probably two two perspectives come out from this story one is an approach of looking at things from a theoretical perspective and one maybe we could say from a pragmatics perspective and as the concept note mentions sociology is looking at the new realities in our society. And so I think uh, Dr. G. Kanato will be able to highlight upon this more as we look at this new age research and research methodology. But with this story and instance, I'd just like you guys to keep, an, like I mentioned before, an open mind and an open perspective about things and how to apply you know, our research and studies to the practical realities, to solving the problems in our society, the ground realities. And as researchers, I invite you all, or first timers who are looking into the world of research and what it means, I invite you all to look at it from that perspective of being able to create you know, change in our society by finding solutions to the issues and challenges that our society faces. Okay, so with that, I'd let, just like to conclude my welcome note and I wish you all of the best for this session. Please engage yourselves and gain as much learning as you can from this. Thank you. I would like to share a story too. My sister met our principal 
in one of an academic session where she gave a talk. And she came home and then she told me that, your principal, I could listen to her talking the entire day. I think that sums up how effective her oratory skills, you know, how meaningful and impactful her speech as usually is. And as usual, today also we are so thankful that she could be with us and so succinctly put into words the entire perspective of our session. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now I would like to give time to Ms. Yongkang Nukla, Assistant Professor, Sociology, for the presentation. Um, good morning, everyone. So the Department of Sociology has uh, prepared a small token of appreciation for our guest speaker and uh, the delegates from ACC College today. So in order to hand out the token, I kindly request Principal Ma'am to uh, come up. Um, for our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Kanatu Tofi, we have a small token which I'd like the principal to hand over. And also, thank you, um, ma'am. And uh, we, uh, I also request Ms. Kelisino Nalio. She is the HOD of the Department of Sociology, ECC, Eastern Christian College. Thank you for coming, and uh, we have a small talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Ms. Younger and Dr. Principal. And now, for the most awaited moment, I would like to give all of our time to Dr. J. Kanada Chupi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Loina, for that warm introduction. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's very rare for uh, you know, a person like me who travels all over the country, but very rare that I get this kind of presence. So I think it's uh, so thankful. I think it talks a lot about our Naga hospitality. I think this, should, this tradition should be kept alive. Um, yeah, I'm so much privileged and happy to be here. Uh, I've known Dr. Hewasa for quite some time through your writings and your engagement with the society. I think I'm very sorry to hear about your father's loss. I think we, I think we have lost a great personality, not just for the Rinma Nagas, but for the Naga society as a whole. But I believe that uh, we, the, the college, the institution is in, in the safe hand. And I wish you all the best as you take up the, perhaps it's a big shoe to fill, but I'm sure you'll do, do a great job at that. Um, yeah, so um, thank you, uh, Sociology Department, for inviting me. Mm, like, I'm a teacher myself, and w one of our weaknesses is like, uh, we are jargon-driven. You know, we use a lot of jargons, especially in our writings, especially whenever you write academic uh, journals, you know. Uh, clarity seems to be missing. Like it's sometimes it's so painful. Uh, you know, after having uh, writing, reading, and researching for the past 15 years, I recently um, sent a paper to one journal, and then the, the one of the it's a peer-reviewed blind review. So one of the commentators said uh, that I sound like a moral science teacher. <laughs> you know that kind of thing. So that's how uh, academic uh, community functions, and sometimes it's so painful. You know, uh, but. Uh, I'm so happy that uh, we are discussing such a, such a topic like this. Two things before I, I go into my talk. Uh, one advice, because like just I was talking to your principal, I'm having a hard time teaching my master's students. How many COVID babies here? Hmm? To those who went to the college during COVID. I'm sure most, most of you, no? Yeah. And it's a very, and I'm having a hard time because uh, I don't know what kind of learning they were doing online and then even they could not really grasp the basic concepts of, of uh, the social science research or the discipline per se. Many of them are struggling to write even one sentence correctly. Okay, so I think more than other students, uh, especially young people like yourself who went through this very uh, once in a millennium kind of uh, epidemic, pandemic, I think you should work extra hard 
try to catch up with the rest of the world. Because see, at the end of the day, you are going to be competing with people who are studying in IIT and this Mumbai and this Guwahati. You're getting what I'm saying? Okay, you're, you're going to be competing with same job, same opportunity. So I think Naga students need to work a bit extra hard. Okay, so as a teacher, as a concerned uh, Naga citizen and like an elder brother to all of you, I'm telling that. The, the second thing I want to tell each one of you is that see to it that, see, the problem with many Naga students is that three years bachelor's, now, kihoi, three years bachelor's, koribo, you go for master's two years. Again, after master's, what you do is you spend five, six lakhs, go to a coaching institute in Delhi and getting re-educated. Please don't do that. Okay? You're getting what I'm saying? Your teachers are here. This is such a wonderful institution. Make best use of it. Okay? Because this is something that I'm, I, mean, I said, it's such a huge loss for, especially for students from Northeast, you know. After finishing the master's, coming to Kota and Hyderabad, Chennai, spending lakhs and lakhs of rupees and starting from Desik. You know, learning about Indian society. And these are things I think it should be very clear while you're doing your bachelor's and master's, okay? So this is one advice I'm giving to each one of you, okay? I'm not saying that don't go to coaching center, no, absolutely not, okay? But don't do like what others are doing, going back to the coaching centers and starting from basic. The second thing I want to tell you is that please don't mind, okay? I'm somebody who is very concerned about young people and uh, Lots of my researchers are also, I'm doing a bit on, on artificial intelligence and how its impact is going to be on our economy and society and, and our culture and stuff. See, uh, but to young people, don't get stuck with being small town celebrity. Okay? Don't mind. I'm sure most of you must have 25,000, 30,000 uh, social media followers absolutely well and good, okay? But the world is much bigger. Okay, I'm seeing so many young people going into depression because of your, your social media handle and your Instagram and this and that, you know. The world is, is much bigger. I think what I want to encourage students from Tetsu College is look beyond, you know, just putting your, some clip on YouTube and then bust. that's the end of the world. Please don't do that, okay. Not only in Nagaland, but even in Mizoram and all these places, you know, that are, are obsession with this. Wanting to be a small town celebrity. Actually, this is really killing dreams. Okay? So that is something that I think each one of us have to bear in mind. See, while we are so obsessed with little things. Yeah, so while we are obsessed with little things, what is happening is people are coming from, you know, UP and Bengal and these things and they are going to overtake us. You're getting what I'm saying? Because they have, they have big dreams, big vision of how our society should go, how India should go, okay? So I think this is one thing, please don't mind, I'm very personal thing I'm telling to the students here, but I think these are a few things that you have to bear in mind, okay? So an elderly brother advice to each one of you here. So let me just go to my, to my uh, talk here. Um, so uh, what I will be discussing this morning is rethinking, okay, re-looking at all social sciences uh, research or the whole endeavor of social science research in Northeast India. So a little bit about myself, okay, I just want to make it a little bit more personal and give uh, illustrations for my own research and for my own life. Uh, see, my training was in, in ethnography, okay, how many of you are aware of what is ethnography, ethnographer? I'm sure you have, are socialist students learning ethnographic methods, right? Okay. So basically, my training was in ethnography, okay? I learned ethnography under uh, this one very famous uh, Indian ethnographer. He was, a, he was a man of from Cambridge University, very old uh, fieldwork tradition uh, anthropologist. So ethnography, basically, I, I was trained as an ethnographer. So um, please open your ears, okay? This, there must be some new terms that which you will be learning, but th these are important, and I want you to learn, learn this. So uh, he was an interpretivist, okay? There's something called interpretation, interpretivist, okay? So there are different schools of how we approach research or how we, how we approach field work or whole research tradition. So basically I was trained as an interpretivist, ethnographer, okay? So in, in ethnography, in, as an ethnographer, what we do is uh, basically we deal with very minutiae details of, uh, of society and culture. Okay, so I still remember, okay, my, my supervisor, he, he used to tell me that, that 
you need to have a very thick description of, of people and the culture or society that you're talking about. Thick description. Please write it up. I think, can I give them books? Yeah? Thick description. Okay? It's called thick description. So this whole idea of thick, thick description was, was given by this very famous uh, anthropologist called Clifford Geertz, okay? which I'm sure even Dr. Hewa says aware from, from cultural studies. We all, all of us use a lot of his methodology. So thick description. Okay? So this is very interesting. Okay? Listen carefully. Thick description in the sense uh, Clifford Geertz uh, borrowed his idea from this philosopher called Gilbert Ryle, okay? G-I-L-B-E-R-T-R-Y-L-E, -E, okay? I'm coming to the methodology part, okay? Just, uh, I'll be systematic here. So he borrowed this whole idea called this thick description from Gilbert Ryle, okay? Uh, uh, a continental philosopher. So Ryle gives this idea, okay? This is, this is so fascinating, something so fascinating about his research is this. Uh, he, Ryle gives this idea about winking and blinking. You know what is winking and blinking, right? So if I, if I do like this to your principal, I might be flirting with her, huh? No? Like this, no? You, you're married, no? Yes, okay. I, I think I'm <laughs> just joking. So, yeah, I think it's safe. Like this, this is, see, winking. So this, this is loaded with cultural meaning. I might be flirting with her. I might say something that, giving some very hidden, subtle message. Bujuba by na? So this is called winking. Okay, blinking might be, I, we blink normally. You're getting my point. I blink, maybe something, dust went into my eyes or because, you know, it's normally that I blink. You're getting my point. So see, what, what, uh, what Gilbert Ryle says is that even in a simple reflexive action like such as just this, it carries a lot of cultural meaning. You're getting my point. See, this is so fascinating. See, this and this, I mean, just... See, biologically speaking, if you are a monkey or a chimpanzee, this, this doesn't have any meaning. But as human beings, when we do this, this has lots of cultural meaning, no? So what, what Geertz goes on to say is that, he says that any social reality, any cultural reality, has layers of meaning. See, see, just this. So that means like culture is multi-layered. Any cultural process, any social process, okay? Listen very carefully, I'll be very slow here. Any cultural process, any social process, very, very much multi-layered, okay? So I'll just give you an example of, of uh, uh, as an anthropologist, I study a lot about family and kinship. That is where uh, we do a lot of theorization. Looking at your principal's family, how many children you have to tell us? Three, no? See, just by looking at the family, okay, husband, wife, three children, but within that once you start, actually start living with them and then start researching her family, lots of meanings would emerge. Her identity, how she and her husband are trying to, you know, both being educated, how you're trying to navigate that, that whole status and the question of gender. You, you know, you're getting what I'm saying? So these are lots, lots of meanings are involved when we start introspecting, okay? So this is basically what an ethnographer does. We try to unravel layers of cultural and social meanings. Are you getting what I'm saying? Okay, so just see for, for an example, as, as a soci sociologist, that you're trying to understand corruption in Nagaland, okay? Corruption in Nagaland would have multiple layers. It's not just that, uh, 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 the Angamisa or the Semas are corrupted. No, no, no. But there are, there are lots of, you know, beyond... See, because the, one of the reasons that, uh, that the problem of Naga society, especially with the whole uh, idea of corruption, is that it has just boiled down to ethnic level. This tribe or that tribe. You're getting my point. But even within corruption, there are layers of meaning. There are religious meaning. There are, there are definitely, you know, ethnic identity meaning. There's, you know, there's even question of gender is involved. You're getting, my, you're getting my, my point. So there are layers of meaning in such even a topic. When, let's say when you pick up corruption, there are layers of meaning, okay? So this is what exactly an ethnographer tries to do. So basically as an ethnographer, I was taught to interpret things, okay? So my training as an ethnographer was, I was trained more in the literary endeavor. As a, more, more my writing, you know, I was taught to be more literary. You're getting my point. So this question of my supervisor told me that 
that social process, social life, cultural life is very, very complex. We cannot study human beings like in a, in a chemical lab or in a zoology and botany lab. Okay, my Hindi. Well, you get what I'm saying, right? As human beings, we are, we are different people. Because like, like I said, even as an individual, as society, as cultures, very, very complex. Okay, so that is where ethnography becomes very, very significant. So as an ethnographer, what I was taught is to do participant observation. Okay, so whenever we are talking about ethnographic methods, ethnographic method, method is basically, it is a, it is a complex of, uh, of method, methods and techniques. Okay, ethnographic method. See, people tend to misunderstand ethnographic method as just field work, but field work is just one component, definitely the, the most important component, but that's one of the component of ethnographic methods. So there are different methods that is involved in ethnographic methods. So, but basically as an ethnographer, what I was, I was told to do is to observe things. You get my point? And my, my supervisor would tell me that, just go to, when you go to the field, sit in people's kitchen, ask for a glass of black tea and see how the husband and wife are behaving. So maybe, uh, you know, this is quite interesting, okay? See, this a lot talks about how we, we do research. So my, my supervisor used to tell me that, see how the husband is behaving with his wife. Sema motahan ki especially the angami sen sema. Eh, pani ani bi? Eh, get my point. Eh, lo jevi. And that's how we talk to our wives, isn't it? See, but, but in, 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 in some society, especially when you are newly married, when you are newly married, darling, huh? uh, honey, uh, you're getting my point. See, so what, what my, my, my uh, supervisor told me is that as an, as an ethnographer, when you start even introspecting on just something very simple as how a husband behaves with his wife in the kitchen setting, he says a lot of meaning can emerge from there. And he, he told me that, that uh, perhaps if, if the husband is being more polite to his wife, probably it's that they are newly married. See, that is, the, that, that is the inference we do. Or if the husband is a little bit being rough to his wife and speaking harshly, probably he said that it might be a very patriarchal society or probably that husband and wife might have been married for 20, 25 years and they're, they're, they are tired of each other. You're getting my point? See, that is how participant observation works. Okay, So, see, that is how, as an ethnographer, that I was taught to see very subtleties of social and cultural process. Okay? We call this, as an ethnographer, we say something called reading between the lines. Okay? Every aspect of so social and cultural life cannot be understood objectively. Okay? Please, please remember that. I think one of the mistakes, okay, let me just, I'm talking about my discipline bias, uh, biasness here, is that especially sociology in the West is that, is that you depend a lot on quantitative methods. Quantitative methods, okay? I'm sure uh, your teachers might be talking to you about qualitative and quantitative methods. So remember this, remember this. There are several aspects of social and cultural life which cannot be quantified. Beliefs cannot be quantified. You cannot quantify how much I believe in Jesus Christ. Or I cannot quantify how much Dr. Hewasa or uh, Dr. Loina believes in Jesus Christ. So these, these are, yes, beliefs, these things cannot be quantified. So what we do is, as an ethnographer, we listen, we talk, and we describe. What we do is, we interpret, okay? So that is my, my training in, in ethnography. That's how I was trained. But interestingly, my whole idea of looking at Northeast India changed when I started learning uh, prehistoric archaeology from my teacher called D.K. Bhattacharya, okay? So what, what my teacher, uh, Professor Vinesh Srivastav, he was the, the former uh, Anthropology Survey of India director, just passed away recently, huge loss for me, uh, is that he, he actually taught me that to understand, please listen carefully, guys, to understand social cultural processes, to understand any topic, okay, to understand any, any issue, he said, do micro study. So if I want to, if I want to talk about, uh, about how colleges are functioning in Nagaland, there are so many colleges, right? But for micro study, I will spend at least one year in Tetsu College, study 
Tetsuo College intensively and make broader generalization. You're getting my point. So whatever data I generate from Tetsuo College, I will use that and then I will say, okay, even in Dimapur, probably this is how colleges must be functioning. So this is known as micro-study approach, okay? As an anthropologist, as an ethnographer, that is how I was trained. But just coming back to archaeology, my whole, the whole perspective of looking at, at, at Northeast India, or for that matter, the whole perspective of looking at India changed, okay? So this is what Dike Bhattacharya, my late archaeology professor, told me. He said, this is very interesting, he said, Kanato, you have to look a little bit beyond your ethnographic methods. And he said, he gave me one very good example. He said, let's, let's test a hypothesis. All of you are aware of what hypothesis is, right? It is a logical assumption, okay? So he said, he talked to me one very interesting concept given by Iravati Karve, okay? Iravati Karve, I'm sure uh, sociologists might know about when you study about Indian family and kinship, very famous uh, Indian sociologist, anthropologist. Iravati Karve say that if you divide India diagonally, okay, diagonally mane, like this, no? this is, okay, diagonally, no, listen carefully, this is so fascinating. He said, he said, let's look into the idea given by Iravati Karve. If you divide India diagonally, he said, the upper half is wheat eating, roti khai. Huh. The lower half is rice eating. See, that means he's trying to make me see in a broader picture, not just uh, studying family and studying Semanaga or Angaminaga, but he said, see from a bigger, broader perspective. Very interesting. And he said that if you see, if you divide India diagonally, all this Rajasthan, Gujarat, Uttar Pradesh, see, all this comes under wheat eating. They all eat roti. Okay? But he said, if you see the lower half, Northeast India, Kerala, Orissa, Bengal, we, what, we do? what do we eat? We eat rice. Hmm. So he was, he was making me see, see the whole research from a bigger perspective. And he said that the cultural similarity extends. Okay, so if you see the wheat, the upper half, it goes up to fertile crescent. Fertile crescent, many all this, this Iran up to this area. Okay, this is called fertile crescent. And he said, if you see the, the lower half rice eating belt, it extends up to Southeast Asia. Cultural similarity. See, we have... We have uh, Terrace cultivation, see? Uh, our food habits are same. Most of these lower half eat dog meat. Uh, somebody, you're laughing, but huh? Huh? we eat cow. Huh? Most of us eat cow. See, this is very interesting. So he said, look, 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 look from that perspective, he said. And he said, there's lots of cultural similarities that extend up to Southeast Asia. So he was actually challenging me and see, making me see the whole research approach from a very different light. And this is one hypothesis he gave me. He said, and this is, I think, I, I wish somebody from, from, uh, from Tetsu College can prove that. He said that if you actually look into the beliefs and the, 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 the uh, re religious dynamics, he said that the wheat, wheat eating, in the wheat eating zone, male deities dominate. So that means gods are mostly male. And he said, if you come to the rice eating, what dominates? Female deities. You have concept of your Durga and Kali and this and that goddess, you know. So this was a very interesting, fascinating, uh, uh, fascinating uh, uh, dimension that 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 I I started learning when when I began to pick up archaeology. Okay. So are you getting what I'm saying? This two whole way of looking at research, right? That is how we conceptualize. So interestingly, what I learned is that from as an ethnographer, I learned something called inductive approach. Please write it down. Inductive approach. It is also known as inductive method. Inductive money. Inductive means I'm starting small and then slowly I'm proceeding. Adding to that, you know. That is, that is something called inductive method. So in order to build theories, in order, in order to come to a particular understanding of any social or cultural phenomenon, it can be any topic, okay? Um, our HOD is, uh, your topic is on? I'm doing on women entrepreneurs of Nagaland. Entrepreneurs of Nagaland. Yeah, so what, as a, for an inductive method, what she can do is she can study perhaps, you're taking Dimapur? Yes. She can take, 
case of Dimapur, and slowly she can go to Dweng Sang, Zineboto, Kohima, and go to Assam. That is how we, we inductive method works. Okay, so as an ethnographer, that is how you know I was taught inductive method. But but looking at Indian society from 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 largely from from as, as an archaeologist, what I learned from from my supervisor, my, my other professor, is that I learned something called deductive approach. Please, please understand that. Deductive. I already have a, have, a, have a model, and from there I'm coming down to some conclusion. You're getting my point. Okay, so that is how, you know, like, this is very interesting. How, how as researchers, we look at this both inductive and deductive method, okay? And mind you, what Northeast India lacks, what Nagaland University, Nehu, or for that matter, even like University, Dibrugar, what we all lack is, we lack deductive approach. Deductive. Because most of us, and this is, this, is, this is a huge concern, okay? See, you are, you are free to challenge me, you are free to ask questions, and you are free to, to say that, that, you know, openly uh, give your comments and observations, but what Northeast India lacks is deductive approach, okay? Because all of us are so focused about I'm particularly I'm studying Sema Nagas or somebody studying Angami Nagas, somebody studying about Ao Nagas. Small, small communities or this and that. What what Northeast India lacks is this whole deductive approach. Okay, this this seems to be like for 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 a researcher for somebody who's trying to understand Northeast India, this deductive approach seems to be missing. Okay, and I'm just coming to to why why it is important is this. Why, why deductive approach, okay, why deductive approach seems to be missing is because I think what Northeast India lacks is new, it, it is a new conceptualization, new way of, please write, new way of conceptualizing the region. Conceptualizations are very, very important. How many of you are, of, are aware of this book called The Art of Not Being Governed? Please write down. Who knows the author? The Art of Not Being Governed? 10 rupees, if you can tell. James Scott, okay. Why, why James Scott concept of Zomia is so famous? Because he tries to locate the whole, you know, Southeast Asia, Northeast, and even going up to this Northwestern bomb as one, one bigger cultural zone. That is a deductive approach. See, so that means he talks about Zomia. I mean, like, how, how Nagas and Kachins and oh, we are all stateless society. You're getting my point. So this is a very, very new way of, of looking at, 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 uh, at society and culture. James Scott, please, I highly recommend this book. Very controversial, okay? Lots of debates are being generated, but... Uh, Tell your teachers to ask your principal to get some copies for your library. I'm sure there is, but the art is not being common. It's, it's an excellent book, okay? To, to, to conceptualize Northeast India or to conceptualize the whole Indo-Myanmar border. Very, very uh, good, good uh, literature, okay, that everybody should read. So that is the whole approach. So see, what is happening, and I'm, I'm telling again and again is that why conceptualizations are important because if you cannot conceptualize a region or a topic properly, your methods won't work properly. Conceptualizing, you know, conceptualizing a topic, research topic is very, very important. Please, please bear that in mind. Okay? So it's, it's very unfortunate because this is something, even in my university, what happens to students is they just conceptualize their, their PhD thesis in one, two weeks. And I think that should not happen conceptualizing research topic or conceptualizing concepts, I think it's minimum, I said that minimum take at least three to four months. Think, rethink, you know, because it is your conceptualization that is going to, uh, going to lead you further into what kind of methods you are going to employ, okay? Am I being a little bit, uh, uh, are you following me what I'm saying? Okay, it is going to decide what kind of methods you are going to use, okay? It is going to decide, it is going to decide what kind of outcomes you're going to have. So conceptualize, conceptualizing a topic, or let's say if you want to study Northeast India or Nagaland, think of new ways and conceptualize Nagaland. 
How do we conceptualize Nagaland? Same old thing. 16 tribes, Ao, Angami, Sema, see, that's it. Or we, we say uh, Ao or Angami, that's it. But can we, can we conceptualize a new way of looking at Nagaland? Guys, are you following me? Bujiba by na? Bujas na? See, for instance, Semas, we tell, okay, Semas, Semakan ki Semakan koi that this is a very old saying among the Semas. Our neighbors know more, more about ourselves than, than we do about ourselves. See, very interesting. Our neighbors know about me more than I know about myself. You're getting my point. And similarly, you see, one of the, the American missionaries by the name uh, Ola Hansen, the first, uh, one of the first missionaries who went to the Kachins, he said, okay, he said, that was sometime in, 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 in the first part of, of the uh, 20th century, somewhere between 1908 and 1909. He said, this is, he said, there seems to be a lot of similarity between the Kachins, the Nagas, see, the Shans, the Chins, the Kukis. You're getting my point. There seems to be a lot of, a lot of similarities between these. And then, see, even today, I think we are not really introspecting on that. You're getting what I'm saying? So what, what has to be done is, in order to understand ourselves, conceptualizing Nagas from a new, new perspective, we have to know how the, how the genes understands us. Are you getting what I'm saying? Because as, as people who are trying to understand Nagal, we are particularly particularly focused on Nagaland. But we have to go a little bit beyond the border and see, because Kachins have a lot of interesting stories about us. Yesterday, I was meeting one Meite student in NIT, and he told me, he said that all my parents used to tell me that Meites and Nagas and Cookies are brothers. And he, he goes on to say that lots of interesting stories about that, you know? Are you getting my point? So I think that is how, what I'm actually trying to tell you is that we have to conceptualize Nagaland from a little bit broader perspective. Go beyond that. A little bit go, go beyond that, you know. See how other communities. And in order to do that, I think that is where this whole question of interdisciplinary approach becomes very, very significant. Okay? Are you following what I'm saying? Okay. I'm a little bit worried that I'm, I'm boring you guys. But this, see, please try to understand this. Treaty of Yandabo, 1826, right? I mean, that is, see, all of us are know about, I mean, this, this, the whole question of Northeast India history of, one, one of the important landmarks about Northeast India starts from 1826, okay? Treaty of Yandabo, how British defeated the, 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 the Burmese kingdom and how they, they annexed Assam, okay? So even today, I mean, like, uh, Dr. Loina, I mean, like, just look at this. I've come across so many writings on, on this whole Assam-Burma relations, okay, or, you know, this whole Anglo-Burmese Burmese relations. But something that I've observed time and again and again from, from the scholars of Northeast India is that we always go with the British records. We always go with the Indian records. But there's a very interesting record from the Burmese court called Waisalisa. How many of you are aware of that? Waisalisa. There's something called, please write it down. Check it out, okay? If you don't have a copy, I'll, I'll try to send it. Maybe it's, it's a very rare book. W-E-E-I. Those of you who are interested in North India, I think you should know this book, okay? Wesa Lisa. W-E-I-S. Wesa. S-A. L-L-I-S-A. Wesa Lisa. Okay? So what Wesa Lisa, and see for me, as, as somebody, as a, as a scholar trying to understand Northeast India, when I started reading, because for 20, 30 years I've been reading the Indian records, I've been reading British records, okay, going as far as, you know, UK and US and then digging up the archives. But when I actually went to Burma, I came across this document, Wesalisa. And just as we, as people from Assam and, you know, India and British are talking about how, how this whole, uh, and global uh, Burmese war happened. Even the Burmese, they have their, their own record. Okay, and when I started seeing Northeast India, the Burmese invasion of Northeast India from a very dis different perspective, actually, it, it actually opened a lot of new questions about the whole, about the whole, you know, Burmese Assamese relation. 
you get my point. I mean, one of the interesting things that I came across is that in uh, Dr. Hazarika, one of the interesting uh, <laughs> records that I came across is that if you talk to any Assamese scholar, they would say that that uh, it was basically the Burmese came and then they completely destroyed and ravaged, uh, ravaged Upper Assam. But actually, you know, the, the Burmese account says that it is actually the, the Assamese people themselves did that. So that, that is a very new way of seeing this whole, uh, how history is being contested, you know. So are you guys, are you getting what I'm saying? I mean, like how we, we see topics from different angles and how this interdisciplinary uh, approach becomes very, very significant and dominant here. Okay? That, that is what just, I'm giving you one example of that, yeah. So, um, just please rise up. I think some of you are sleeping. <laughs> Come. Okay, I'm almost done, okay? Hmm. Take it very informal. Come, come, just rise up a little bit. Come, come, it's okay. Okay, the, the students came. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you may be seated. The other dimension that I want to talk about, okay, that is why I don't want this to be up on the YouTube. <laughs> I want you to learn. I'm here to you, you to learn, not, you know. Uh, the, see, guys, please understand. The other dimension that, that as sociologists, as teachers, we have to understand is this. Please remember this, especially I, I want to tell this to the teachers. The kind of research methods, the kind of research techniques we are teaching the, to the students, many a times do not become applicable in the field. I'm sure, yeah. Learn about it, okay? And because this is, I, I really want to talk, talk about the exigency of, of how complex social and cultural research are. The kind of your questionnaire method, your interview method, huh? You're learning about case study. I'm sure you're learning about historical methods. You're learning about, about genealogy, about schedule, lots of research. You, you can be really good at that, memorize it, and then write in the exam and get 100 out of 100. But to actually grapple with, with the complex social, social and cultural, it, it actually doesn't work that way. And I'll tell you exa one example. Before going to the field, me being from Delhi University, we were trained very well in, in, in different methods and techniques. Okay, if you meet people, how to, how to apply interview method, okay, how to apply focus group discussion, you know, or, I mean, there's so many techniques and methods we learn. But, the field reality is very, very different, okay? Please, as researchers, as students, write it down. Adapt to the field situation. Please write it down, okay? Adapt to the field situation. Because we need to reinvent our methods and techniques when we go to the field. And I'm gonna give you a very good example here. We, we need to rethink, reinvent, okay? I'm a tribe, hmm, I'm a tribe. For many years, I've been so fascinated by Jagannath Temple. I mean, one of the most famous temple in Puri. I'm a researcher, my, my friend is also a researcher. She's a Brahmin. She's Acharya. I'm tribal. So according to the caste system, I'm an outcast. You're getting my point? No matter who you are as a researcher, I think your identity, it took your embodiment, okay? Please remember that these are very important, okay? That this is called embodiment. Because, see, we cannot detach ourselves from, from the whole research endeavor, okay? Next time you invite me, we will talk more about subjectivity and objectivity. I'm not going to that, but remember this. This whole question of embodiment becomes very, very important, okay? So what I'm saying is that your gender, okay? Your religion, your economic background, all this influences the research outcome. It influences what kind of data you're going to get. Have you ever thought about that? Dr. Hewasa must be so 
so happy here. She's the boss principal, huh? enjoying so much part. Don't mind. If she goes to, you're from which village? Hmm? Pension, you know? If she goes to, to her customary court, she might not be allowed even to see. I'm being very honest. Her status, her, her, all her PhD might not work in, in, a, in a customary court setting. Because her gender very much, very much influences that. Are you getting what I'm saying? I'm giving my example of how my identity, me being from a tribal community, has, has influenced the outcome. Okay, so one thing you have to understand is that your economic background, you know, your, your, your social background, your position, okay? I'll tell you, I've interviewed so many famous Naga personalities, okay? So if, if I'm going and talking to a, to a villager, hey, Ahibi, Ahibi, sit, I can say, Nam kia se, kila bosti. Say, a little bit, because by the virtue of me being educated and maybe being more economically sound, I can do that. But what will happen if I go and interview Dr. S. C. Jamir? Yes, sir. I get my point. Oh, he's, he's a high, he's a person. I'm a researcher. See, you're getting my point. So what I'm saying is that that is how position, status, okay? Power, these things are very, very much gender. This, these are very, very important aspect of any research process, okay? And see, one thing that, that most researchers in notice, I think the mistake that we make is that we think that whatever data pertaining to Northeast India can be very objective. I think that that is a little bit far-fetched idea. So my, my argument so far, wherever I go, I've been telling that, that we also have to give space that, that whenever we are studying Northeast India, especially in social science research, we cannot have a very objective view of society and culture because like i said our, our identity our who we are very much outcome plays an outcome who is any angami here angami no i'm, I'm just uh, let me break i'm writing a my, my next work is on the biography of Ezat piso me as a sema if i'm writing about Ezat piso i might not be a little bit you know, by the virtue of me being Sema and I have my own historical reasons and my parents or my uncles were all involved in the whole Naga nationalism. So I might not be very, very um, generous in my description of Ezek Pizo. But you as an Angami, I mean, he's taken to be the, the, uh, the father of the nation. I mean, it's so dangerous to say something wrong against me. You're getting my point. You know, Angamis can summon you to the court and then, you know, chase you out from here and there, huh? that kind of thing. You're getting my point. So even, see, I'm just giving an example of even writing biographies of famous people. Your, your ethnic affiliation, your gender, or where you belong, I think that very much matters, okay? So one thing, see, why, why scholars from Northeast India have to be, I'm almost done, okay? Why scholars from Northeast India have to be very, very, particular about how notice is being represented is because for so long outsiders are representing us. Are you getting what I'm saying? I, I, are you getting what I'm saying? What you are learning about notice India is, because I'm saying this, as he might be from Harvard or Cambridge, but he's not just a Harvard or Cambridge product. He's a man, he belongs to certain caste, she belongs to certain family, she belongs to a certain ethnic community, and that is really going to decide or influence the outcome of how notice is being, going to be represented. How many of you know that in the research, a recent book published on, on Nagaland, NCRT, do you know what, what is the language spoken in Nagaland? This, you imagine, NCRT textbook, written by two, two people from North India, Languages spoken in Nagaland are Hindi, Nepali, and Bengali. Are you, are you getting what I'm saying? So that, see, so what I'm saying is that 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 this whole question of, of how we represent or who is representing us, who is writing about us, plays a very very important, role, very very vital role. This is one thing that you have to understand. And similarly, vice versa. One of the reasons which which a person like me, I call myself as an auto auto ethnographer. Auto ethnographer, mane. Auto ethnography, mane. This is a, when a person goes back and study his own society. Okay, you're getting my point. 
So you as a, as a Lota or you know, as a Sema or an Angami, when you go and start studying your own society, researching your own study, uh, uh, community, this is not, you're, you're an autoethnographer, okay? New term, okay? We can have more talks maybe next time about the whole question of how to do autoethnography. That is a different question altogether, okay? But one of the mistakes that autoethnographer, especially when we are writing about Northeast India, whether it's Tripura, Assam, or whoever, we think that whenever we are writing about, about Northeast India, what we are writing is the accurate one. I think that that comes with a huge amount of arrogance. See, I'm being very honest here. Please don't mind. As, as native researchers, as, as, as a Naga studying Naga society, listen carefully. There are certain perspectives I might have better. Okay, I can have a better perspective. But me as an individual with just three and a half pound brain, with lots of you know, cultural, social interconnection, I cannot have an accurate des description of, of, uh, of my people or the region. You're, you're getting what I'm saying, okay? Because I've realized okay, in my research, what I consider to be of no importance, I think, hey, this, this uh, topic or this uh, social process might not be very important. Let me just neglect it. Other finds that very interesting. And then they are coming up with very interesting findings because he's an outsider and he's seeing my society from a very different lens. You're getting my point, okay? So remember this. Please write this down, everyone. As researchers, as researchers, we have different vantage point. Okay, this is the original idea huh? I'm giving you. Vantage point. V-A-N-T-A-G-E-P-O-I-N-T. -E Dr. Hewasa, as a, as a researcher, you know, as, as, as a principal, as, as a Rengman Aga, as a mother, as a daughter, as a woman, will have a different vantage point than me, Kanato, from Zineboto, huh? raised in a, in a small town in Zineboto, in a very patriarchal setting. So, I mean, like, we are, we are going to have a different vantage point. Are you getting my point? No, even if we are applying the same methods, same to same, huh? reading the same book, being taught by the same teacher, vantage point differs, okay? And I think this is one very important point which researchers from Northeast India should acknowledge, okay? We cannot have complete authority because this, this, this melding of ideas, this fusing of ideas, okay, this exchange of ideas across disciplines has to happen, okay? So whatever sociologists are saying cannot be the complete truth. Whatever historians are saying cannot be the complete truth. But this all, I think as researchers, seeing from a rather very big, broader perspective and then having this interdisciplinary approach, I think that is how we are going to have better understanding of our subject and, 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 and the topic that we are researching, okay? That is the thing. How many minutes have I taken? I, hmm? Can you take more? Yeah. I, I talk for living, okay? So I can talk all day, huh? As long as you give me a cup of coffee, I can take all day, okay? So, so these are things, okay? I, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. I'll take your questions. But the last thing I want to tell you is that uh, in the beginning, I said we need to have new conceptualization. I mean, how to conceptualize notice as a region. So uh, can anybody tell me, just feel free, how, how do you, is there any new way to conceptualize notice India? How do we conceptually? Dr. Hazarika, please help me here. How have we been understanding Northeast India so far? What is our, our, our like just talk about the general description of Northeast India. How do we understand Northeast India? Some parameters. Think, think. Northeast India. Let's say if I have to ask you describe Northeast India as a sociologist, no? How do you describe? Tell me, it's okay. Uh, anybody here? Uh, I, I'll give 10 rupees. <laughs> anybody? Anybody? Student, anybody? So it's okay, feel free. I'm not here to judge you or thing. Come, come, let, let, let's talk. Anybody? Hmm. Notice India, okay? As a, as a student of sociology, as a social science student, all right? Understanding Notice India. How, how, would, you, how would you define uh, Notice India? Or how do you understand Notice India? Come, come, few parameters, give me, tell me about Notice India. What do you understand about Notice India? Hmm? It's okay, come, come, speak up. Shy? Don't you, you don't want to talk to me? Help me out. When we, uh, so far, when we look at Northeast India, we okay. always see that Northeast people are different. Different. Uh, people Mainstream. Okay. We always differ in, we look at Northeast India as different. We always uh, concentrate on the features, on the culture. 
Mm -hmm. Should have it, okay. That's interesting. That's the same thing, no? We talk about seven sisters or eight, one brother, huh? right? You, 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 see, that, that's what we do. Thank you, thank you for that. See, I think Northeast India has to be conceptualized. Rather, we need to bring new innovative conceptualization, theorization. I'm giving an example. So, just coming back to, to earlier what I said. See, what my teacher told me about the diagonally dividing India, no? What he was trying to tell me is that, is that Northeast India is not different from other parts of India. You're getting my point. So when we see Northeast with a new conceptualization, he's saying that, okay, you eat fish. He as a Bengali eat fish. Cultural similarities. You eat rice, I eat rice. You're getting my point. See, so I mean, like, so when you begin to conceptualize notice from a different angle, new findings are emerging. You're getting my point. So that that's how. Just I'm just giving a very best basic example of how conceptualization. See, one one way that I am conceptualizing notice India is seeing notice India as a people between two rivers, Chinwin in Burma. You can steal my idea, okay? Most welcome. Chinwin in Burma and Brahmaputra in Assam Delhi. Lots of similarities. We have lots of, lots of uh, cultural exchange. See, because, I mean, I mean like, it's, it's very interesting. When we begin to conceptualize Notice India, just let me give an example of Naga people. We always say that we were isolated, we were in the jungle, you know, and we were, we were different from others. But, I mean, like when you begin to have new conceptualization, new findings are emerging. So for one instance, there are lots of historical evidence to show that, that the Ahom people and us, lots of cultural exchanges, lots of similarities. You're getting my point. When you begin to see Northeast India from a far, from, just give me an example of Nagaland from a, from a different light, we say that, that there was no threat route. One very ancient trade route runs from Dimapur. Hmm. I'm giving an example. Here, uh, that you have that uh, Kachari, uh, that one, no? From here goes to Jaluke. From Jaluke goes up to all this uh, uh, Benru village and goes down to Infa. 500, 600 years of, of uh, trade route. And where did I find, find that? I found, found that this from my native friends. You're getting my point? So I think that is how, no, we, we really tend to have new conceptual, and I'm just giving an example of how to conceptualize notice. And this is one reason, one of the new conceptualization that I'm trying to actually bring in to, to understand notice India. Burma, between Chinwin and, 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 and Brahmaputra River. Because if you actually look into the whole uh, dispersal of Naga population, whether it is in Arunachal or Assam or, or Nagaland or Manipur, we all live between these two important rivers. And these two important rivers have shaped our cultural history. It has shaped our migration behavior. It has shaped our, our food habits. It has shaped how we adapt to the environment. Are you getting what I'm saying? Okay, so I think this is, see, I'm just giving you an example of how to actually conceptualize uh, Notice India from a, from a different light. The last thing is that if, when you go through my book, uh, one of the new concept, conceptual, conceptual one, of the, one of the theoretical approaches that I brought was something called Baptist Highland. Dr. Loina, have you gone through that Baptist Highland? Okay, so Baptist Highland, in Baptist Highland, in, in this new way of seeing Notice India, in this new way of seeing, seeing the Indo-Myanmar border, what I have done is, I've constructed a model called Baptist Highland. So if you see the whole India-Burma international border, it's about 1,600 kilometers, okay? So between India and Burma. And if you see Kachins and Nagas and Chins, okay? We occupy this highland. And one thing that is common to all of us is that we are all practitioners of Baptist faith, okay? We were all evangelized by, by American Baptist missionaries. Okay? And when we actually begin to see this whole region as one, one whole this uh, historical, you know, uh, geopolitical space, lots of similarities. As far as our, our understanding of, you know, this nationalism is concerned, as far as our understanding of, of culture is concerned, like, uh, you know, this, our, our, our understanding of our approaches to state is concerned, 
lots of similarities, okay, between Kachins and Nagasin chins, right? So I think what one thing that I want to tell each one of us here is that, uh, yes, good, definitely. In, in, in what I want to conclude is, please learn about methods. Very, very important, okay? Part and parcel of any any discipline. Learn about it. Get well adept at it. But what I want to challenge uh, students. Um, I'm very sure I'm talking to some, the, the, the best and the brightest mind in Nagaland, is that think of new ways, think of new conceptualization, think of broader conceptualization that you can bring to Northeast India. Okay? Dr. Hazarika, I think it's time Assamese scholars stop looking at Gangetic Plain. Because all our conceptualization is that your caste system, your, your vegetarianism, everything comes from that. But remember this, that that majority of northeastern communities we trace our migration to Mekong, Jinwin, Irrawaddy, and Sangpo. We are all from that side. You as an Ahom, you are from Salwin. Hmm. So I think instead of looking at the Gangetic Plain and having new cultural understanding, I think it's time we look the other side. You're getting my point. So this is one way of actually looking at northeast India. Okay. So methods are good. Interestingly, I like we good. We should learn about it, but. But having bigger models and bigger way of look, looking at North East India, I think this is going to answer a lot of questions and also bring maybe bring new light and infuse new light into the whole research endeavor in North East India. Okay, so thank you so much for listening patiently. Yeah, mm. thank you. Mm. I have lots. Second, second part, okay? First part is over. You invite me next time. Okay, continue with the second part, okay? <laughs> He's a revolutionist in the academia. That's why he is also not so keen to share his talks. We can understand that. Um, he is actually a very busy person, and we were able to have him join us today only because of his genuine concern for our young Naga students. And we are so thankful that, um, as he has been sharing, uh, he is one of the few scholars who have been revolutionizing the way of researching and understanding Nordic and tribal communities in particular. And I'm very certain that um, the way that he presented to us today so lucidly and in a very, um, covering all the aspects of methodological approaches, not just the students, but even the teachers. Uh, your, your sharing with us has really helped us look at uh, different ways of understanding Nordis and doing research in particular. So we thank you so much for that. And we will have the questions. Anyone can ask, ask as many questions as possible. Even faculty are most welcome. Yes. <laughs> it's okay. I'm sure you know most of the, if you have anything, something related to your research you want to know and all, most welcome to do that. I rarely come to the map, though, okay, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I think that, that what you're trying to ask is something which I'm sure even your st students are aware. I'm so tired of this perspective called ethic and emic, you know? You know, you're aware of that? Ethic perspective and emic perspective. Yeah, I, I think as researchers, um, I think Dr. Loina, this is a little bit uh, very uh, technical, which most of the students might. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, but yeah. Is that uh, this, uh, th there's a very interesting book I mean, which I feel is, is like uh, the, the Bible for people like me. I'm an inter interpretivist. I'm a, my researchers, is, my writings are more literary. I, I look it that way. Is that one of the books that I almost take it like a Bible for me is, is something called Writing Culture. Okay, please, please write that, that, that book. That's, that's a very fascinating book. And this whole, uh, I think this is one book that actually really, really transformed sociology and social anthropology. 
but this question of objectivity and subjectivity was, was going on for such a long time. So it's called writing culture. Marcus and Clifford, okay, writing culture. I have a copy. I think if you guys want to go, I think you're most welcome to do that. So what writing culture did is going beyond this whole dichotomy of insider versus outsider. Writing culture, no? Uh, and, and there's another book which was published later. It's called uh, uh, Anthropology as a Culture Critic. I think which you can also look into that. Very, very important for sociologists also. But see, uh, what happened is that uh, in this particular book, why, why uh, this whole change basically the even going beyond the ethic and the dichotomy is that uh, this uh, book with the publishing of this book. Uh, there was a crisis in, in social sciences, okay? 80s, 80s we had a very terrible time. And slowly we, we were all doing modern uh, social science research, more objective, and then after that it became postmodern. okay? So uh, many, many social sci scientists say that this whole uh, 1980s with the publishing of writing culture was a deciding factor of moving to this whole postmodern research or postmodern ethnography for me as an anthropologist. Is that uh, this whole 1980s, there was something called crisis of representation. Please write it down, crisis of representation. Who, who is the research, crisis of representation, my name, who is the researcher trying, trying to represent? Are you trying to represent yourself? Are you trying to represent your community? Or are you trying, trying to represent your, your gender? Okay, and remember this, this, if you read works of people like Aiwa Ong, these are like very famous uh, sociologists, uh, social anthropologists. I mean, even the, the, the question of, because see, if you look into the all writings of whether it's J.P. Mills, uh, Ao Nagas, uh, Jech Hutton, uh, Sema Nagas, J.P. Mills, Rayman Nagas, these are all male perspective representation. And so, so see, what happens in the 1980s is that this whole question of, of who the researcher is trying to represent, I think that really changed the, 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 the whole dynamic. So, Yes, coming to your question, insider and outsider is, yes, very important. But I think postmodern research has gone beyond that. Because we are not seeing researchers, not just as an insider, as an outsider, but we are saying that a researcher is invested with multiple identities. Please write down, researchers are invested with multiple identities. We are multiple identities. We, uh, we, we, we occupy multiple roles. We occupy multiple social positions. Dr. Hewasa is a principal here. When she goes back to her house, she's a mother. Uh, she's going to, I'm sure she cooks for her husband. You do that. You, sometimes. Wife. So as an aga, my You're getting my point. So, see, different roles. So, even for a researcher, the, the multiple roles and the multiple identities we occupy plays a very important role. Dr. Hazarika is agreeing with me. And Ahom, Mel, uh, he belongs to a little bit dominant community. Ahoms are, you know, Gundas in Assam, okay? Just joking. They are, they are a very dominant community. So I think even you belong to that particular community is going to decide the outcome of the research. So yes, insider, outsider, very much. And I think till up to 1980s, this was the whole debate. If you read works of people like Robert Redfield, even for that matter, this whole question of Verstehen, which Max Weber talks about, you know, that insider subjective perspective, it was all based on the dichotomy of insider versus outsider. But I think after the 1980s, we have started to look at research, especially the researcher, as invested with multiple identities. So that means it's not just only you are, whether you are a SEMA and as an outsider going and uh, studying Angami society, that, that is not the case. But you as, a, as Loina, you belong to a certain family, you have certain family history, you, you are a particular, you belong to a particular gender, you belong to a particular clan. No. So if researchers, listen to me very carefully, if researchers fail to understand that our researchers can go wrong, because we cannot just look at researchers from this whole dichotomy of outsider and insider. I think for so long, and even today, I think many researchers think that, that research is basically, I'm an outsider and going and studying somebody, or and I'm an insider and studying. Uh, but I think we have to write or navigate our, our research work, our, our data collection, or how we describe, or how we are representing people based on these multiple identities. Please remember that, okay? So go beyond that. See you as a researcher invested with multiple identities. I think that is how to proceed the research. Very interesting question.
You kiss your and sing for Hovering. Exploit me, okay? I, I really come to you. Please, sir. I have two questions, but I'll just ask one for the sake of time. Uh, what is your thought? What is your take on the decolonial approach? The decolonial approach to research, uh, especially in the context of its appropriation by certain ideological frameworks. Okay. For example, in mm. the Indian context, there is a decolonial approach, uh, especially in, you know, uh, for indigenous uh, communities. But there is also an appropriation which is happening by the Hindu supremacist ideology. Mm -hmm. So what is your take? How, how, as a researcher, how do we uh, address this? Yeah, so what, what Dr. Hazarika is talking about is he's basically coming from a perspective for post-colonial theory. This is the post-colonial theory. I think some of you should pick up a book by Lila Gandhi, very interesting. Or pick up a book by, I think, I think you should pick a book by Gayatri Spivaki, which are both I think read, read the works. Very interesting question, just coming to that. Uh, so Dr. Hazarika, uh, sir, is coming from, from uh, this whole question of post-colonial theory. Okay, so what the question is asking is that that how uh, countries like India or Burma or for that matter even certain Afri African countries. I think Algeria is a very, very good example. Franz Fanon, I just read his work. Okay? It is a very interesting scholar called Franz Fanon. Okay? I'm giving you lots of names. Franz, F-A-R-N-E-Z, F-A-N-N-O-N. -N -N -N. Okay? You have to read, guys. Okay? There's no other option. Franz Fanon. Okay? So, He's asking about this whole decolonization. So, one very interesting book called Decolonizing Methodology. I have a book. I think you should take it from me. Yeah, I think she has made it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I think that, that came from New Zealand. Okay, so. Uh, as far as the, this whole decolonization is concerned, I think basically so far, uh, the, the Post-colonial theories have been looking, let me be a little bit abstract here, but looking from the perspective of power. Power is not very, very important in the dimension. So actually they are trying to, to, to uh, break down the power structure that the West is better than us and you know, how they see us and seeing us as savages. And, I mean, lots of this representation. Interestingly, you know, Sema Nagas, if you read any Sema, Sema girl here, this lady, I'm going to give you one very good uh, description of Sema Nagas. Ah, uh, here, huh? If you read J.H. Hutton's book, no, don't laugh at them. Huh? J.H. Hutton says that uh, among Semas, ugliness is the rule. Sema women, this is, this. He, Hutton says that all the Sema women are ugly. I think that is, that is a very imposition of how the West see beauty. I mean, like Semas, we talk about Ongi. How many of you know about Ongi? We say that, that Semas were so beautiful that even the heavenly beings used to come and then marry us. That's what what. No, that's, that's, our, that's our story. But if you actually read the works of J.H. Hutton, I think she says that it's all the same women are ugly. Uh, she got this, she says that Anga women are women are harmful, you know? Very interesting. I mean, interestingly, if you read J.P. Mills' work, I mean, to be honest, this is a very important stuff. J.P. Mills says that all the our women are loose, loose character. I mean, who is he to say that our, our beautiful, nice our women are loose character? Would you write that? So I think these are things that, in terms of how representation, how power, and how history, that is one way of actually looking at this. The other thing about uh, about this whole whole uh, about this whole uh, uh, decolonization of methodology is that uh, of late, of late, uh, people are saying that that many of the conceptual theoretical developments that is being developed in the West do not apply to us. I mean, that is what where African and Asian feminists are saying that we, we don't want you know, Western feminists speaking for us. That is what Arab women are saying. I mean, listen carefully, I'm talking a lot, but for an Arab woman, uh, this West might say that wearing a hijab, okay, you might agree or not agree, wearing a hijab is a form of oppression. But if you talk to an Arab feminist, she said, well, that's empowering. That, that talks about our purity and that. You're getting my point. So, see, this, this question of how, how the West is representing us. True literature and things like that. I think this has to be challenging. I think that's how story researchers are doing that. Uh, very interestingly, uh, Edward Said Orientalism. Okay, please write this book called Edward Said Orientalism. I think that uh, coming from, from literature, I think that really changed the whole way of how 
how the, the, the Western people had been constructing the Orient, okay, Pars and Indians and people in the East. So it's a thick book, but I think if any students from literature, I think you guys should read that thick book for Orientalism. Okay. But interestingly, I mean, there's a new development, and uh, see, because we cannot, uh, every, uh, listen to me carefully, guys, every theory or every methodology or every conceptualization has its inherent weakness. So there's a group of scholars from the West, and there's a whole movement called Occidentalism, okay? Not Orientalism, but Occi, O C C I D D M E L. So it's something called Occidentalism. So even they are saying that, no, 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 it is not only the West who is giving a wrong representation of the East, but these scholars are saying that even we in the East are giving wrong representation of the West. A very interesting thing, okay? But for instance, people, especially from the East, we think that we are morally superior to the people in the West, you know? That we are, uh, we are parampara and we are, uh, you know, more like family oriented, while the West are loose people, loose character, that kind of thing. So I think, I mean, even the West are saying that it's not only us, but they are seeing inherent weakness, in, especially in the writings of, of people like uh, Diane Wistler and all. One very last question, since you asked, uh, one of the, the biggest critique of Diane Wistler is this, uh, the, the, especially the Western scholars are saying that Diane Wistler uses especially India, okay, this, this uh, India as a, as, a, as a model or India as an example to theorize about the whole uh, post-colonial movement. So, uh, Western scholars are saying it's, it's like, it's, it's wrong because India is so diverse, you know? So you cannot just use, especially Spivak uses uh, Bengal, Bengal case to talk about, theorize about all India or to theorize about all South Asia. So even they're saying that there is inherent weakness in the whole decolonizing and technology, decolonizing and theories. A lot can be discussed by the Yeah, so that's the thing. So three, three dimensions of seeing things. Read both sides, you know, how, what, how the West is now. You, you are unable to catch up. Can I just add something? Yeah, please. Yeah. What Dr. Renato has said, because uh, what he brought out is very important. I think the question that's been asked about, you know, also relates to what is the role that our students play in, you know, rethinking this and it. And just by questioning and raising issues to change the narrative. What Last one, it's okay, and we can close. What approach or methodology do you usually apply when studying about monolithic society? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, it depends. Like, see, it, uh, initially, if you see most of my writings about about Nagaland, you know, it's purely ethnographic. I've done a lot of ethnographic work, but uh, in these past five, six years, I've been doing a lot of archiving. Archive science is like very important because uh, in order to understand people and places, we need to put them in the historical context. I think one of the reasons why uh, the Sajji Sanjeev Barua's book, I mean, like India Against Itself and stuff, are very famous is because he, he's just like any other uh, political scientist or sociologist, but he puts whole notice India within the historical perspective. He knows his history. I think that's one of the reasons why. Uh, that, uh, it, so for me, it's a mix of. If you see my book, it's a mix of both archive science as well as my. So it depends what kind of work you are doing. So if I, when I write about Indo-Myanmar border, well, especially with regards to our association with state, I do a lot of uh, historical reports. But when I have to talk about the current issues about about uh, the, the uh, army takeover in 2021, I think that's where ethnography becomes. You have to talk to people, you have to observe, and you have to take notes. So it all depends on what kind of thing. So my, my question is that you have to be adept in different methodologies, not just sociology, so you know sociology, but move, move a little bit into history. Uh, even to my students here, uh, at least have a see, uh, don't be just one discipline specialist. Uh, last, my last comment is that uh, even if you are doing sociology, at least get to know what is the basic thing of what is happening in literature. Uh, as students of literature, you should know what are the, at least the basic concepts or basic development that is happening in political science. See, until and unless you do that, none of us are going to survive, okay, with the whole coming of NEP and 
and jobs are getting scarce. If you guys, please remember that I'm being very brutally honest here. Until and unless we adapt to new innovative learning techniques, and then they have much broader perspective going beyond all these things, we will perish. Okay? So I think that's my advice. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to point out that uh, I think it's a cultural thing in Nagaland where students don't ask questions because we are so used to not speaking when our elders are around. So we are trying to break this trend, but we are still in the initial stage. And it's not, I don't think it's because they didn't catch up or they don't have questions, but I feel that it's because of this cultural, something that we have been so conditioned to that our students are uh, struggling to break out of this. Anyway, I want to add that I first met, uh, I mean, I first heard Dr. Kanato speak uh, sometimes back in 2009-10, and his talk changed the way I looked at Naga history itself. And I'm sure that what he has shared with us today has influenced all of you uh, to re-understand and revalue and uh, whether it comes to valuing our culture, whether it comes to understanding our society or doing research, I'm sure that his talk has really had an impact on all of you. And with this, I would now like to give the time to Sidit Hazarika for the word of thanks. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, I hope you all enjoyed this very informative lecture today. I'm Jeet Hazarika, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm an assistant professor at the sociology department. And uh, it is my honor and privilege uh, to propose a vote of thanks to all those who helped make this seminar very successful. So on behalf of the Department of Sociology and the entire fraternity of the Tetsho College, I first of all extend my most sincere gratitude to our invited speaker, Dr. Z. Kanato Chofi. Dr. Chofi, thank you for gracing this seminar and for delivering the most illuminating lecture. We had an opportunity today to hear your thoughts on research, and I'm sure this will help many present here uh, in their pursuit of knowledge, more particularly in, in social research, in terms of methodological practices and uh, the need for new conceptual routes to approach Northeast India. I thank our college principal, Dr. Hevasa El King, for the welcome address and for uh, her constant support for this program. I also thank our college director, uh, Kulo Lorin, for his constant support and encouragement uh, entire, throughout the entire uh, you know, pro programming of this seminar. Any program like this would not be possible without the support of the technical and maintenance teams. So I take this uh, opportunity to also thank the IT department and the maintenance department for all your support. But most importantly, I thank the participants uh, of this seminar, students and faculty included. Uh, this seminar has been for your sake. For me, personally, there has been many important takeaways from this lecture, and I hope you all feel the same. I also thank uh, my department colleagues for the coll collaborative work in presenting this seminar. And I also have to mention uh, that we have amongst us delegates from the Eastern Christian College. And I thank you all for your presence and participation today. Uh, your, your presence adds to the success of this seminar. So uh, I may have missed a few mentions, but please consider yourself included in my gratitude. I thank you, uh, everyone, once again. And uh, have a good day. Thank you, Sujit, for the wonderful word of thanks. Uh, and with